Up next, we have a special guest star in the house, the true OG of the industry. Um, in, uh, introducing Andrew D'Angelo, who's a co-founder oh and direct corporations at Harborside in Oakland. Um, Harborside was founded in 2006. It's one of the most iconic names um, in the industry. We've all heard of it. We've all followed along their journey. Um, and they've had quite the journey. Uh, they're a vertically integrated California cannabis business with real tech retail locations in Oakland and San Jose. They have a 47 acre farm in Monterey. They have over 250,000 registered patients. Um, and they, were, they have a series of firsts. So they were the first retailer to demand rigorous testing for all products, which is really insightful in the path that we're about to go down here in Arizona. Um, they were the main target of an infamous federal government campaign to shut down California's medical marijuana industry, which led to a four-year court battle that ended with the Department of Justice dropping the case in 2016. Um, it's a major win not only for Harborside, um, but our entire industry. So we owe this man a lot. Um, he also sold the first round of legal cannabis in California on uh, January 1, 2018. Um, and in June of this year, there was on the Canadian Stock Exchange. So he's here to talk about what happened when California went from a medical market to an adult use market from the perspective of an owner-operator. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn when it comes to testing bills that are being passed and it's where hopefully about to go through this transition to adult use. So without further ado, Andrew. Thank you, James. Thank you, Dimitri and Maya, for bringing me here. It's great to be with all of you this evening. Let me first say the community spirit and feeling in this room is fantastic. I'm thrilled to see women grow with such a strong presence here. I'm thrilled to see so many women in the, in the space tonight. Uh, I'm also honored that you are honoring your prisoners and, and getting them out. I uh, just a uh, shameless plug, but we started a new uh, nonprofit called Last Prisoner Project. Steve and I are dedicated to getting every single prisoner for cannabis out, not only in the United States, but all over the world. There are 40,000 people locked up for doing the same thing that many of us are doing every single day. And they're locked up because they're poor. They're brown, they're immigrants, and they couldn't afford the kind of defense. Or they got locked up under mandatory minimums. We've got people serving life sentences for working with this plan. So, lastprisonerproject.org, please donate, plug in. The feeling's really great here, and at the end I'll take a selfie so that um, I can IG this gathering tonight. <laughs> So, I'm here to talk about what happened in California. I know that you've got about 498 days before you're going to have adult use on the ballot. Who's ready to win this time? Who's ready to win this time? Who's ready to kick Sheldon Adelson's ass when he comes back into this state and he tries to kick our asses? No. It's not going to work this time. You're going to get on the ballot. You're going to get the signatures you need. You're going to raise the money. You're going to run a great campaign. And you're going to win. And you're going to bring adult use to the state of Arizona. And we're going to get this done. So let me tell you about what happened in California. California had legal medical in 1996, first state in the world, first place in the world to end prohibition. And then we didn't pass adult use uh, until 2016, 20 years later. And when we passed medical, it was mandated that the state needed to regulate. Well, they didn't. For 20 years, they did not regulate anything. So the local people had to regulate. And that's how this whole patchwork of different rules and different regulatory structures and different tax structures started to happen in California. And that's very problematic when you're running a business. It's helpful if everywhere in your state sort of has the same framework and sort of has the same tax rates. It's helpful, right? 
California didn't do that. So then activists, we tried to pass adult use, very much like Arizona. We lost on our first go around in 2014. We made the mistake of putting it on the ballot in our off year election. That was a disaster for us because the progressive and liberal voters who care about cannabis just didn't come out on our off year election. And so we lost three or four points, very close. Then two years later, not unlike Arizona, we worked hard to get it back on the ballot again. And California is a big, complicated state, and we were pretty broke after losing in 2014. Yep. And so we needed some help from some donors. And whoever donates and finances the initiative generally plays a pretty big role in writing the language of that initiative. And the language is very important because if you don't get the language right, the program might not work so good. And if you give up too much to pass the law, like local control, we gave a lot of power to the local people in the adult use law. That was a mistake because most of them banned it. Sixty percent of municipalities in California banned adult use. Eighty percent banned retail. So now in the largest state, cannabis state in the world, eighty percent of our transactions even today, a year and a half after we legalized adult use, is happening in the illicit market. We only have 20% of the transactions. Now, we didn't think that it was going to be that bad when we started gearing up for January 1st, 2018, the, that first sale. We figured, okay, we had to give up something to the locals. We had to give up something to the tax man. We had to give up a lot to the tax man in California. Tax people, I should say. But we thought, well, weed's legal now and the people will come because it's legal, we've got lab testing, we're gonna have this great industry and it's gonna work despite the local control and despite the taxes. And we were wrong about that. And right now in California, most businesses are struggling to make a profit because a lot of the patients that were in our program before adult use are in the illicit market. Certainly if you're a heavy consumer of cannabis, like me, I, I consume a lot of cannabis every single day, hundreds of milligrams, smoke about a quarter ounce of weed a day. Uh, and it's very hard if you're a heavy consumer of cannabis to deal with a 50% increase in the price, which is basically what happened when we went from medical to adult, the price of cannabis went up 50%. How many people got a 50% raise ever in their life? Very rare. So the, the price increase of cannabis was much higher than anybody's wages increased. So what happens? People go to the illicit market. The illicit market is very talented and good at providing access, wide access. You can buy a bag of weed just about any place in this country pretty darn easily. The other thing the illicit market's good at is keeping prices steady, if not pretty low. When I was in college, 1980s, you could buy a good, really good bag of weed cost about 50 bucks an eighth. Today, really good bag weed costs about 50 bucks an eighth. <laughs> so the price has been stable in the illicit market. The supply has been robust in the illicit market. Access is easy. And the customer experience in the illicit market, by and large, if you're not getting anything contaminated, not getting anything dirty, not getting anything from a violent cartel, the customer experience is not too bad. You're in somebody's house, you have a pretty close relationship with the person who's supplying you cannabis. 
you have a bond of trust because you're both doing something you're not supposed to be doing. <laughs> and the experience is pretty good, right? So why the hell should I go to Harborside and pay 50% more? I'm a heavy consumer of cannabis. Why would I do that? The answer is you don't. You go to the illicit market. So that's why we only have 20% of the transactions in California are happening in the legal market. So what's happening? All this money's coming in from Canada and other places into California. California, everyone's so excited about California. And we're all fighting a brutal competitive war with each other to capture this 20%. And what's gonna eventually happen, what I worry about, is the investors are gonna say, bye bye California. We're gonna take our money and our energy someplace else. Maybe Nevada. Or maybe Oklahoma that has more dispensaries in Oklahoma right now than we have in California, if you can believe that. So, access and affordability are the two things that we have to work really hard to achieve in the legal market. If we want to create one market for cannabis, and that's what we want to do, because we cannot launch Prohibition 2.0 to protect a few licensees that are building moats around their businesses. Prohibition 2.0 will not work. Prohibition 1.0 didn't effing work. 2.0 is not going to work either. The illicit market is smarter than the cops. I'm sorry. I wish, it, maybe we wish it wasn't that way, but it is that way and they will win. So what we have to do as an industry, not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get this done, particularly in California. But you have an opportunity here in Arizona perhaps to learn from some of the lessons that we've been through, perhaps to do some things a little bit different. And if you do bake high taxes into this initiative, understand what that might do to empower the illicit market. Understand that very carefully. You're introducing lab testing, fantastic. Something the illicit market will never be able to do. Use that to get people into the shops one of the mistakes we made is we were so excited January 2018 to sell legal weed to adults, we did not spend enough energy differentiating ourselves from the illicit market. So the first couple weeks of January 2018, man, I had a line around the block. Everybody wanted to come into the dispensary and buy legal weed, and they were all so excited, and we were so excited. And I didn't have a big sign that said, we're lab tested. You don't have to worry about pesticides or herbicides in this product. You don't have to worry about heavy metals in this product. But I didn't do that. And so people came in, they saw the prices, they bought a little weed, and then they left. And they didn't come back. Those that had a connection, right? You had a connection, why do you come back? If you don't have a connection, then you're gonna come back. So this is the central challenge that we're all facing. So if you have high taxes, understand what that's gonna do, and then market the legal industry to differentiate from the illicit industry. I'm very happy to see you at home grow in the initiative. Very important that we allow people to grow at home. They're not going to threaten your supply chain. They're going to combat the illicit market, right? Because the home grower, they're going to go to the illicit market before they come into the dispensary. So let them grow their own. Then they won't go to the illicit market. That pushes the illicit market closer to us. Again, we don't want prohibition 2.0. We want to get everybody in. We want to create one market. There, there is no, really, there is not much of a dual market for alcohol and other things that are legal that we regulate, that we bring out of the shadows into the light. Eventually, one market occurs. Even in states where 
you have dry counties for alcohol, or you have the state that actually owns the store that sells the alcohol to you, you don't really have secondary illicit markets for those products very much, despite what you might see on Moonshine. It's just not happening at scale. So, that's my experience, is that it, 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 adult use is critical. It's a critical milestone for us to achieve. The way in which we do that will determine outcomes. And so be smart. Learn from the mistakes that we've made in places like California. Very hard to fix an initiative once it's been voted into law. Elected officials are hesitant to reform it. For two years, I've been trying to get Sacramento to lower the tax. We failed to pass the bills. For a couple of years, I've been trying to get Sacramento to take away local control if that municipality voted for Prop 64, adult use. You shouldn't be able to ban it if your people voted for it. That's democracy. That bill lost too. So I don't know if we're going to do better next year in California. I don't know if it's going to take two or three years. But in the meantime, 80% of our transactions are in the illicit market. And now there's a whole bunch of talk about funding Prohibition 2.0 in California right now. We already know it won't work. We all know that's not going to work in this room. What are we going to do? Lock everybody up again? Really? No. So let's be smarter. Let's design a framework that will create one market, that will bring heavy consumers into the legal market, and that will bring working class people and people that aren't doing as well financially into the market. Make sure you have some compassion programs built into the law so people who are destitute can get some cannabis. That's one of the things they took away in, in Prop 64, because they're so worried about diversion. Now, now I have a bill, we have a bill to try to get that compassion program back. So you have to make good choices. And I know the next speaker is going to dive into the details of your initiative. Um, someone just gave you the phone number. Very transparent. Very transparent and good for you. I would call that phone number if you've got questions and concerns. Some of you might be pissed off about some stuff that's in your initiative. Well, you've got a phone number. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be happy to listen because the way we craft good policy is by listening to each other, being smart, and not letting fear or greed win the day. So, there is plenty of room in this. If we create one market and there's no illicit market anymore, you'll all do great. You'll all do really well. Everyone will do really well. The moats will overflow. You won't need a moat anymore. That's how powerful this market is if we can create one market. And that's going to come down to affordability, it's going to come down to access, and it's going to come down to people feeling good about coming into dispensaries and experiencing all the wonderful things you have to offer. So thank you yes. for bringing me to meet you. It's great to be with yeah. you tonight. I look forward to another one. I am Thank you.